Hello, this is Father Louis Skirty, Friends of the Word. We're here in Galway. We're at Nuns Island. We just attended Holy Mass at the cathedral, which is very beautiful. We'll get back to that later. We'll see some other insight pictures of the cathedral. And here we're at the Poor Clare's Convent on Nuns Island. The chapel is in the back and you see the cathedral in the distance. We're here visiting the Sisters of the Poor Clare as well as the cathedral and the beautiful sights of Galway, Ireland. The weather today is cool. It already rained, it rains at night, wake up in the morning to a wet mist, and then by noon, the sun starts coming out, and here we are enjoying the beautiful weather and scenery and architecture of the Galway Cathedral in Galway, Ireland. We'll be back with more selections from our visit to Ireland and the poor Clares. This has been Father Louis Scurdy with Friends of the Word. Hello, this is part two of my interview with Sister Colette, novice mistress here at the Poor Clares Monastery in Galway, Ireland. Sister, thank you very much for having us here you. again. I thought we'd begin section two of this interview by explaining this. It's a very unusual structure, and I think coming to a convent in which there is cloister, we'll explain what that is in a few seconds, uh, it's uh, interesting to understand what this is all about and the origins of this, what we call this, is a screen. So we're going to go back to Sister Colette, and she's going to give us the insights to what this is. Also, you have to realize, as Sister will explain, that this is a secluded convent. It's in the middle of Galway. Uh, it's a location of prayer. You'll understand that as we continue. Okay, sister, thank you very much thank again you. for the interview. Uh, let's explain what this is okay. and the origins of the, the concept. Well, we take a vow of enclosure. Uh, some contempl we're a contemplative monastery, a monastery of contemplative nuns, and uh, some, some orders that are similar to us observe enclosure, but don't take a vow of, us, vow of enclosure, but for ourselves we actually take a vow of enclosure. So we have the three traditional vows that religious have, poverty, chastity and obedience, and we take a fourth vow of enclosure. Mm. So the grail, we call it the grail, is, right. is a symbol of the enclosure. Uh, as you can see, it's not going to keep me out or keep right, you in, right, or right. the other way around, <laughs> keep me, me in or keep you out. Uh, it's a symbol of a deeper reality. and. Uh, really, it's a symbol for every Christian that there's a place in our heart mm. only reserved for the Lord, for Jeez. our relationship with the Lord. And this uh, is a symbol of that there is a sacred, like a holy holies mm -hmm. uh, within our hearts and within every Christian heart where we can meet Jesus face yeah. to face. And um, we renovated this building, as explained to Father Louis, uh, in 2009. And we were wondering, you know, um, the counter would have been sufficient. Okay. Um, but did we want to retain the grill? And all of the sisters, except for one, I could say bar one, and that would be <laughs> fun, <laughs> um, felt, yes, we wanted to retain a grill of some kind. But we didn't want it to be imposing, uh, that it would be a barrier or um, put a distance between ourselves. Because... Uh, as I say, there's a mutual relationship between ourselves and the people who come to us, people come looking for prayers. And so that it's not a, a barrier between relationship mm -hmm. and between uh, um, explaining our lives, and yet it leaves a question mark. Uh, right. Why? So uh, for us, we wanted to retain it because it, it does speak uh, without saying anything. Yes. And... Um, I think that uh, I think we've come to a good, a good solution. you know, we, we had great meetings kind of uh, <laughs> trying to design it because we wanted to get away. We the previous one had bars down okay. and it was actually it was a beautiful grill too. the metal in it was lovely, but it was dark. It was a metallic finish and it just in photographs so that it looked dark and um, the kind of downward bars kind of give an impre impression of prison, which is not. No. I'm not imprisoned here, okay. you know, and um, so we didn't want to give that impression, and yet we wanted to retain something so it's bright. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's various interpretations of what, what it actually is. Looks like to the, sun, the sun or the Eucharist, or <laughs> right. oh, you know, right, there's right, all right. kinds of 
things, but uh, yes, yeah, so that's, it's a symbol of the, the fact that we have stepped back from maybe mainstream life. Um, we're still very much part of the world. Uh, we're not, uh, we're human and fully human, fully alive. And yet we've taken a step back uh, to be in the world for the world, yes. but in a, um, I suppose, in a deeper way to kind of concentrate on the Lord. And it's to facilitate that. It's not, it's not um, an imposition. No, no. Mm -hmm. So the sisters here don't go into the city? Not usually. We, we, um, St. Clair had, had things like for necessary, reasonable... St. Clair the, the founder. The founder of with St. Francis. With Saint Francis. Right, right. And uh, so she, um, you know, so we, we, she would say we never leave except for... And so for us it would be dental, if we go to the dentist or the optician or the hospital for tests. Okay. Or to exercise, um, you know, uh, you know, to to vote, okay. constitutional rights. I was trying to think of the word. Um, so for necessary reasons, oh, okay. but other than that, we don't. Okay. Yeah. And, and occasionally as well, we have a, a federation uh, of poor clares in Ireland, and they may run a course every few years or something like that. Oh, and you will meet. Mm. Okay. Mm. How many convents or monasteries throughout Ireland are there? There are six. Six. Or seven. Six, I think. <laughs> okay. And spread throughout the country? Yes. Yeah. Are they in the north? Uh, they were in Belfast, but they, they closed in Belfast two years ago. Okay. Yeah. So now they're Unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Um, the outside world, I want to bring that in for a second. When guests come, who are the guests and who are the people who come? <clears throat> well, um, to the parlour, usually this is the parlour where we, uh, this would be where we'd meet our families. And um, sisters would have a few close friends maybe that come to visit them. So they would be usually the visitors. But we have a lot of people coming to the door and they meet the sisters. Uh, sorry, they, they meet, they come to the door looking for prayers. They may want to meet a sister, they may not. And if they do, a sister is available to, to talk to them. Sometimes they just want to write a petition and leave it mm -hmm, there. Mm -hmm. And so they would come to the front door and there's a reception area there. Uh, it's only if they wanted to talk to some talk about something more personal that they could come into the parlor or that is not okay. necessarily usually and how many of these parlors do you have we have three parlors and because yesterday when we came we went with, sister, with Anne mm -hmm. uh, in the, the parlor named St. Anthony oh, yes. <laughs> that's that's one the smallest has, its, has its own <laughs> name, name yeah. that's yeah, great so this is St. Clair's St. Clair's yeah. that's great uh, let's talk about St. Clair the, the origins of the uh, poor Clairs I know St. Francis was an associate of hers. Yes, uh, she was very inspired by St. Francis. He was older than her, but they were contemporaries. And um, she used to meet him secretly with a companion and she heard him preaching. And through that, she left home one night when she was 18. Mm. Very brave. Uh, she went through what was called the door of death. It was particular. She was uh, of the nobility. So, um, you know, they were a, a very important family. It was expected that she would marry strategically. Mm -hmm. um, but she, that, wasn't she, that wasn't what she wanted. So she, one night, Pan Sunday, uh, in the middle of the night, she ran away with her friend. Her companion went with her to accompany her, went to the Port Siuncla, which is at the, just outside the city of Assisi. Mm -hmm. And that was the centre of the Franciscan order. So St. Francis received her into the order at that stage. So at that stage, it wasn't even the poor Claire's. She was becoming, she was received by St. Francis, yeah. who had, a, who had it's just male companions. Right. So I'd say he didn't know what to do with her. Really. <laughs> <laughs> so he brought her to um, a Benedictine monastery first and then to another monastery. Um, and then they came to San Damiano, which was one of the churches that St. Francis rebuilt. Yes. And yes. that was where she lived uh, her religious life. She. Yeah, she left. She left home in uh, twelve twelve, and she died in twelve fifty three, twelve fifty four. Mm -hmm. Around that. For further information, you have to go online and research Portuncola, Assisi, San Damiano, of course, Saint Francis, because you'll have all of the locations which are there now, very well attended and visited by people throughout the world. And Portuncola is a little chapel within a huge church, Santa Maria degli Angeli, which is Our Lady of Angels, and that Pochinko is a little chapel, and in that building is where St. Francis died. 
from going back to sister. <laughs> so he, he received St. Clair there and he cut her hair. That was part of the reception ceremony. And she had beautiful long blonde hair. You yes. associated with an Italian really. She, yes. And they, they still have her hair. And then her, uh, so he brought her to this Benedictine monastery, which was, had, it was a papal sanctuary. And her uncle, who seems to have been the father, must have been off the scene at that stage, possibly dead. He came after her because she was valuable. And uh, so he, when he came in, she held the altar cloth, which was showing that she was taking refuge and uh, claiming the papal protection and took off her veil to show her shorn head that mm. she had made the consecration. So he couldn't touch her. And he didn't either, yeah. So they knew what they were doing. They yes. hadn't thought out. <laughs> they, they, yes, exactly. Sometimes you get the idea that he was naive and she was naive. Mm -hmm. They weren't. They were very intellectual, well-trained, yeah. educated. Yeah, and, and she had a focus. kind of, very much, she certainly had a focus in the sense of, of uh, she, even you can see with her rule, she was the first lady to write a rule in... Uh, for religious women, mm. and um, you can see what she took from the Franciscan rule and what's her own. Right, you right, know, right, yeah. Right, so she right. very much had a mind of her own. So when you originally came and you you met with the abbess here, uh, did she educate you in the ways of the the Franciscan ideal charism, or did you do that on your own? I, mm. I suppose that it was very conversational. Good. You know, we just used to chat. And I suppose just in the course of that, you were getting more. I didn't know that much about St. Clair before I uh, entered. I just okay. was attracted to uh, it being Franciscan and being a, a vocation of prayer. And I suppose I, I just grew in my appreciation of her since I entered more than uh, I didn't know that much about her. What did your girlfriend peers think of you when you said... <laughs> You see that convent over there? <laughs> I'm going to join them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I got all kinds of reactions, really. And, um, you know, it was amazing. Some people that you thought would understand, because I was involved at prayer meetings for uh, um, a few years before I entered, three or four years. And um, so some of my girlfriends would know that. Yes. So they knew that I was taking my faith seriously, and yet they could see I was still having a good social life. Uh, so some of them were amazed and some of them were um, not surprised either. And um, But some of the people that I thought would understand more, maybe in the prayer circles, kind of didn't get it at really? all. Yeah, And then That's other nice. people that maybe weren't even practicing their faith could really, really get it. It was really amazing. It, it was an amazing journey, really, because um, I suppose uh, in coming in, you're saying goodbye to a lot of different things, a lot of different people. And you get a chance to say things that we don't normally say to each other as friends or family or relations, um, that maybe we only say when we're dying. Mm. And uh, so it was, it, was, it was a painful journey in many ways, but it was a, a beautiful journey. And uh, yeah. Because you were being called, I mean, yes. from inside. I yes. mean, so your, your heart was focused, uh -huh. that's, that's great. Typically, young woman comes, what is she going to expect when she's all stages of inquiry, discernment, novice, what, what should she expect here? Okay, well, um, I suppose when somebody is thinking about it first, it's good to, to make contact because um, like with the internet and social media and everything is fantastic. Yes, because, yes, it's great. you know, uh, you can check out different websites, read, uh, look at, at video clips like this, this even. <laughs> uh, and it gives you a feel for, for what it's about. You know, you have this stirring in your heart and you're just kind of wondering, is it this, could it be this? Do I really want this? And then you have uh, the possibility to investigate without making a um, kind of a big commitment. Mm. You know, so that's very good. Uh, there's an awful lot of information out there and to be discerning about where you get the information for, because of course there's misinformation sure, as well. Sure. Uh, but really personal contact is so important. That's good. That's because good. we can have, a, um, even watching an interview like this, we can have a completely different idea of what the reality is like. Right. And right. to come to the place, first of all, there's, there's, uh, there's something about each individual place. Um, you know, I had thought maybe a Port Clare monastery, not in Galway, and I had gone to visit a few of them, and you get a sense of oh, interesting. Yeah, good, good. I think I was expecting a, a 
thunder and lightning, <laughs> flash of lightning when I got to the right one. That didn't happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there was a, a, a sense of rightness. Right. So it's it's the same, I suppose, when you you know when you meet somebody, if you're attracted to someone, you can't put your finger on it. Exactly. But exactly. you just know there's something there. And um, so it, it's the same. There is something about the place. And people even yeah, say... Location, location, yes, location. Yeah. <laughs> so. And when they come into the monastery here, even though we're in the center of the city, that's so peaceful oh, and it's, everything. Yeah. It's heavenly, really. Mm. And we cross the bridge and it's another world. Yeah. We were saying it yesterday. Yeah. It's so peaceful yeah. outside and inside. Yeah. What's interesting, I want to tell you two things. Um, this morning, because I kind of celebrated Mass, um, some of the friends that I was visiting here came. Now, one of them is from Holland, and we had a long conversation the other day, and they have no faith. I mean, she has no faith, okay, no religious faith. Yeah. Uh, she's excited about her children uh, talking about God, but she, she didn't grow up with God. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know what that's like to grow up without any knowledge of religion, mm -hmm. okay? So she said, but that's most of the countries like that. And she heard I was here today, and she came, and she was so impressed. I don't think she's ever been to a Catholic Mass. And this was simple, mm. but it was beautiful mm. with the singing of the sisters. So I think your mission went out through the gates and into Holland eventually <laughs> because it, it, it touched the simplicity it's and the amazing. peace touched, touched mm. her. I know, I know it did. Yeah. And it was just a beautiful experience to be here. You said before that you're not in prison. We were talking about these. Your choice was to leave the world... Yeah, you, I've spoken to yourself, Sister Faustina, a few other sisters. You guys are very aware of what's going on out there. You, you Obviously, you're educated, you're, you read. Let us know more about that. What, what, what's that all about? Well, it's important to know what, what's happening in the world. Yes. I mean, we're here uh, before the Lord, like Moses was really interceding before the Lord, uh, bringing people's petitions. So people come, as I said earlier, to, to ask for prayers. So we have a, a, a volume, you know, volume of people coming to the door looking for prayers all mm -hmm. the time. Letters also. And uh, so from that, you know, you get a great insight into the burdens that people are carrying. And often, silently, really, people don't know the burdens that other people are carrying, we can we can put on a brave face. But then, when when you meet people face to face, or they pour their heart out in a letter, you can really see what's going on mm -hmm. in people's lives. So that is illuminating. Then you know our families, uh, the contacts that we have with them, and also um, one or two, a few of the sisters would listen to the radio news at one o'clock mm -hmm. uh, every day, and just to keep abreast of what's happening and okay. fill the rest of us in then we get a uh, catholic newspaper every week so that's very good on world news as well sure it's yeah. very important because we're here representing the world and praying for the world it, and it would be a misunderstanding to to think that the sisters who embrace this life escape the world you're oh. praying for the world mm -hmm. and and for us outside yeah. you couldn't in the trenches. you couldn't stay here if you were trying to escape the world Good. You know, Why? Because uh, we carry we carry ourselves in in with the world. So if you're trying to escape, what are you trying to escape from? Usually, it's our own responses to our, our our own wounds and hurts. And if you didn't have the vocation to live in enclosure, you couldn't you couldn't uh, you couldn't stay. Um, our our way of life. I, I mean, I think that there are an awful lot more ways to escape outside. You know, if you're having a bad day, you can check something out on YouTube or get a video or go to the movies or go for a drink, ring somebody. You don't have those opportunities here, so you're left with your own fragility. Mm -hmm. And it's in that, actually, that we find the Lord. But it, it, there's no escaping what's going on in our own hearts, especially in here. There's no chaining the word <laughs> Lord and there's no escape in yeah, the world. Yeah. This has been Father Louis Gerda with Sister Colette, mistress of novices here at the Poor Clare Monastery in Galway, Ireland. We're going to have another interview in a few moments, and you'll see it in subsequent uh, segments. But you realize with each segment we've had so far, we've gone deeper into the life of the sisters and, and the 
transcendent spirituality and yet connection with God that they have um, as they, the sisters, pray for us out there and come into a greater appreciation of their own spirituality inside the convent. This has been Father Louis Skirty and Sister Collette with Friends of the Word. We thank you for joining us and we ask you to tune in to our next segments. And we're going to put information on our credits for how to get in touch with these sisters here in Galway and other poor Claire's throughout the world because this is the World Wide Web. Thank you. Keep the word alive and well. God bless you.